This week on C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast, a discussion on abortion and reproductive rights. University of California Davis Law professor Mary Ziegler discusses the history of abortion and contraception laws in the United States. Hang tight, class starts right after this. Hi, I'm Tammy, and joining me today is Paul, as we celebrate 45 years of C-SPAN's unblinking eye on the democratic process. That's right, Tammy. Since our founding in 1979, C-SPAN has been documenting history with a unique approach, unfiltered, without commentary, and entirely independent from government funding. C-SPAN is funded by fees from our cable and satellite distribution partners, and now with fewer people subscribing to cable and satellite, we're asking you to help support our next 45 years. It's amazing to see how C-SPAN has adapted and grown. With the rise of digital platforms and social media, C-SPAN has expanded its reach. So no matter where you are, you have 24-7, 365 access to the democratic process. And as we navigate this ever-changing media environment, C-SPAN's dedication to putting you in the rooms where politics is debated and policy is determined will not waver. We ask you to support C-SPAN's vital mission. As we celebrate 45 years of service, your contribution helps us to continue to adapt and grow in this digital age. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your contribution today. Here's to 45 more years of bringing democracy directly to you wherever you get your news. Thank you for your support. Visit cspan.org slash donate today to make a difference. Thanks so much, everybody. So this is obviously more material than I can cover in an hour. So um, this is a snapshot of the history of reproductive rights and justice, starting from the 19th century to the present. Um, it's also something that's in some ways very hard to lecture about now, because it's, it's I, have, as Professor Lawson said, am one of the main historians of this stuff, and I'm also living through it with all of you. So it's a strange time to be discussing this as history when it's also very much real life. So. I think now, often when we think of reproductive rights and justice, we think of them in the context of criminalization and criminal laws, but that's a relatively recent phenomenon. So if you go back far enough, and there's a dispute about this that was reflected by the Supreme, in the Supreme Court's decision in 2022 in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, uh, the majority, led by Justice Samuel Alito, um, suggested that in the United States, to some degree or another, abortion had always been a crime at any point in pregnancy. Um, he might have said or might have believed something similar about contraception. But the reality was that for much of United States history, either passing or implementing criminal laws regarding reproduction would have been very difficult, in part because it was all but impossible to identify when someone was pregnant before quickening or the point at which fetal movement could be detected. Distinguishing whether a drug was a contraceptive, an abortifacient, or a drug that simply helped people who were having irregular menstruation was all but impossible. And physicians relied on highly unusual and ineffective methods to test whether someone was pregnant or not. Touching someone's abdomen was considered off limits and inappropriate at a time when women and other people who could get pregnant were often hidden behind screens during examinations. So physicians to tell if people were pregnant would do things like examine their noses and mouths, which you might be surprised to learn did not result in reliable diagnoses <laughs> of pregnancy. Um, so at this time, there was a sort of sense that there were female remedies that might influence pregnancy one way or another. Um, and for the most part, state laws didn't apply uh, until quickening, the point at which abortion um, was most often criminalized. There were exceptions to this. There were laws, for example, poison laws that regulated uh, drugs that could kill pregnant people early in pregnancy, uh, particularly starting in the 1840s after a series of high profile deaths from poisonous concoctions used to end pregnancies. Um, there were some states that treated abortion as a misdemeanor early in pregnancy. Um, there was very little regulation of contraception at all until the late 19th century. And that was to change because of two independent social movements. Uh, the first was an, what we would view as an anti-abortion movement, though by no means a fetal rights movement, that began in the mid-19th century and was led by physicians in the American Medical Association, including Horatio Storer, who's pictured here. Uh, the American Medical Association was new at the time, and medical education in general did not in any meaningful way resemble what we would see today. So there were no real licensure rules in a modern sense. Medical education was completely foreign and often not very credentialized at all. The difference between a so-called regular physician and a midwife or a homeopath selling medicines in the pages of the nation's newspapers was sometimes hard to distinguish. And the doctors in the American Medical Association were looking for a way to set themselves apart 
professionally. They also were worried about what they saw as a grievously differential birth rate. What they would have viewed as white women, Anglo-Saxon Protestant women, were having fewer children. And as the 19th century continued, this disparity would only grow. So much so that when it had been normal in the United States for decades for the average family to have eight children, that number would decline to three by the end of the century. And disproportionately, Storer worried that decline was coming in families he viewed as the best American families at the same time that immigrant families, disproportionately Catholic, were having more children. He argued, too, that life began not at quickening, but at conception, and that only physicians like him, physicians with the expertise to understand science, knew when life began, and that this was what distinguished them, both morally and professionally, from the midwives and others who had disproportionately been serving pregnant people for the centuries before. Storer lobbied for laws that would punish uh, not only physicians for performing abortions, but patients for procuring them, to use his word. Uh, abortion at this time was still synonymous with miscarriage. So the crime he proposed was the crime of procuring an abortion or miscarriage, a crime that he proposed should be punished the most harshly when a patient was married, because a married person having an abortion was a married person rejecting their duties to their partner, or in this case, he would say their husband, as much as it was their duties to the nation. Storer began promoting these laws in state legislatures in the 19th century and gradually convinced legislatures in most states to introduce laws, although they rejected some of the harshest proposals that Storer introduced. It was relatively unusual for state laws to authorize felony punishments for abortion seekers, and virtually all, with the sole exception of New Hampshire, included exceptions for the life of the pregnant person, um, something that Storer also was not particularly concerned about in his proposal. Storer wasn't alone in wanting to regulate reproduction in this era. Uh, this handsome gentleman, Anthony Comstock, was part of the picture, too. Comstock's proposals were very different, though. He was not concerned with what he saw as the taking of fetal life. Um, he was concerned, instead, with what he saw as obscenity. So Comstock's business model, first developed in New York in the late 1860s, came about because Comstock, by his own account, was a compulsive masturbator who worried that exposure to pornography was damaging the nation's fabric for young men and women alike. He proposed a New York law that would define a much broader class of materials as obscene, everything from medical textbooks to art involving nudes, um, as well as abortion and contraception, which he defined as obscene too. Indeed, not just abortion and contraception, but any remedy for female troubles, as he would put it, because there was, of course, no way at the time for anyone to discern re consistently whether someone was pregnant or whether a drug acted as a contraceptive and abortifacient and a menagogue for regulating menstruation or as a placebo or a snake oil remedy. Comstock's model that passed in New York in 1868 then quickly went national. Uh, with the advice of a Supreme Court justice named William Strong, Comstock went to Congress and convinced them to pass the Comstock Act, which made it a federal crime to mail any of the items listed or in the Comstock Act, as well as receive them, subject to up to uh, several years in prison and a hefty fine. Um, so Comstock's perspective was different. He wasn't invested in protection of fetal life. He was invested in stopping sex. He argued that the problem with abortion and contraception was that if people knew they would avail were available, they would have what he called incentives to crime. Essentially, they would be able, as he put it, to conceal their sin because they would be able to have sex without consequences. And so both of these models quickly spread. Um, there are state Comstock laws. This was an era when, for the first time, state laws of many parts of the nation criminalized birth control, many of them on Comstock's model. And significantly, there was always a close connection between reproductive rights and freedom of speech. Comstock's model criminalized not only the mailing of items used for things like contraception and abortion, but also information about either one. So there was always a sense that telling people about how you could get these things or how you could do these things was as deeply problematic, in his view, as the doing of the things themselves. The 19th century, though, was hardly a period in which people stopped having abortions or using contraception. Indeed, the birth rate continued to plummet as states began implementing both abortion bans and many Comstock laws. And as Comstock enforced the Comstock Act in increasingly ludicrous ways, um, including, for example, 
um, confiscating the reports to donors of suppression societies for the suppression of vice like his own because they had reported on the existence of things like abortion and contraception. Informing people that you were arresting people for abortion and contraception was obscene because then people would become aware of abortion and contraception. Um, having said that, of course, in the 19th century, it seems as if abortions were actually increasing, contraceptive use was increasing too. And so there was sort of an uneasy compromise that emerged where Americans were having abortions and using contraception, but no one was really arguing that there was a right to do either one or that either Either should be legal. At the same time, advocates for abortion bans were arguing that fetuses or unborn children were persons, but no one was arguing that abortion laws that were liberal were unconstitutional either. This was kind of a constitution-free zone for some time. Um, and that began to change gradually, in part because of another movement that would have a strong effect on reproductive rights and justice down the road, the eugenics movement. Uh, eugenics, uh, as a concept, was a term coined by Francis Galton, um, a cousin of Charles Darwin in the late 19th century. Uh, and the idea that Galton had was that if you could breed livestock to improve its genetic qualities, why not breed, as Galton wrote, human beings to have better genetic qualities? And exactly what eugenics would mean legally was complicated for some time. So some uh, scholars and legal thinkers argued that there should be legal incentives for the quote unquote right sort of people to get married. Um, there were, for example, better baby contests where the purported genetic quality of infants would be rewarded with cash prizes or apple pies. And of course, there were much more interest in negative, what's called negative eugenics, right? Using the law to prevent the, the quote unquote wrong people from having children. Initially, some of these laws focused on access to marriage, on the theory that if people were, for example, suffering from sexually transmitted infections, they shouldn't get married. But then, of course, reformers quickly realized that people could have children and have sex without getting married, and turned instead to compulsory sterilization laws, which are on the books, were on the books, in uh, more than 30 states in the United States, including California, which was one of the nation's leaders in compulsory sterilization. Uh, these laws applied to people we would now recognize as having mental illnesses or disabilities, but to a much larger class of persons as well. Uh, California, for example, often targeted persons who were viewed as sexually promiscuous on the theory that sexual promiscuity, particularly in women, was a sign of feeble-mindedness or genetic unfitness. Um, overwhelmingly, the people targeted by these laws were already in state institutions. Uh, they were overwhelmingly low-income people. Initially, they were overwhelmingly white people, in part because of either de jure or de facto segregation, ensuring that people of color had no access to state institutions or services at all. Um, this was to change after World War II, when people of color, particularly black people, made up the overwhelming majority of sterilization victims as sterilization moved south. The eugenics movement changed the status quo when it came to abortion and contraception in a few ways. Obviously, in a sense, the eugenics movement was compatible with what had come before, because just has been the case with Storer or Comstock, the message of the eugenic movement had been that, of course, it was the role of the state to control who reproduced and how. Um, albeit in a different way. The claim of authority from eugen of eugenesis was not moral, as Comstock's was, or even Christian. It, was in, uh, it sounded in scientific expertise. Eugenesis simply knew better than everyone else the argument went about who should reproduce. On the other hand, the idea of eugenesis was that more reproduction was not always an unmitigated good. And in fact, that certain circumstances, it may make sense for certain people not to have children at all, or not to have more children and that the cost of having children, not just to the individual, but to the state, was something that the state could take an interest in. It was at this time that the first birth control movement organized, and that movement had, to varying degrees, involvement in the eugenic movement itself. Um, so you see here pictured Margaret Sanger, who some of you, uh, most of you know as the, the figure who coined the term birth control, the founder of Planned Parenthood, who began her career in the 19-teens connecting birth control to socialism and the rights of workers and transitioned in part to enlist, trying to enlist the support of eugenicists who were at, at the time enjoyed popular backing across the ideological spectrum. Um, everyone from uh, conservative Catholic activists to members of Congress viewed themselves as supporters of eugenicists. And Sanger, who was deeply pragmatic, believed that her cause, which she saw as an individual right to birth control, would be more popular um, if it were embraced by eugenicists too. 
Some of her colleagues, including Mary Ware Dinette, who's pictured to her left, uh, rejected this idea of courting eugenesis and instead framed birth control as an issue of democracy. Uh, Dennett argued that it was unreasonable to assume under the Comstock Act that Americans were incompetent to decide for themselves when to have children, much less when to consume information about birth control, and that it was inconsistent with the idea of democracy to patronize Americans in this way and to deny them this kind of information. Um, the, the fight for birth control uh, gained supporters outside of the white community, too prominent uh, Activists like W.E.B. Du Bois and Mary Church Terrell, who's pictured here, endorsed the use of birth control in their communities, even as birth control, like many movements of the era, um, had ties to eugenics. The birth control movement, for the most part, didn't embrace the idea of a right to abortion at all, although precisely what it was embracing was complicated at a time when no one knew how drugs worked. So common drugs that were marketed at the time, like uh, Miss Lydia Pinkham's Remedy, for example, um, were sold as contraceptives and abortifacients, and many viewed them as placebos that didn't work at all. So precisely what a right to birth control would entitle you to was ambiguous, even if no one was endorsing abortion on its face. In fact, if anything, Sanger argued that abortions, which were d dangerous at the time, one of the leading sources of maternal mortality and morbidity, would result in part because access to contraception was denied. There had also been an unspoken consensus about how criminal abortion laws would be implemented that had applied for this era. Um, overwhelmingly, when an abortion was justified had been left to the discretion of physicians who could invoke exceptions for the life of the patient. But the difference between life and health of the patient in the 19th and early 20th centuries was non-existent. At a time when maternal mortality and morbidity rates were high, even compared to the shameful current standards for maternal mortality and morbidity that we still experience. So the upshot tended to be that physicians were rarely prosecuted for abortion unless a patient actually died. Um, and then often were prosecuted using the dying declaration or dying words of the patient themselves. Um, competent practitioners, by contrast, were rarely prosecuted at all, and even those who did face prosecution often weren't facing long prison sentences and sometimes came back to practicing abortions after their prison time ended. After the 1940s, this changed pretty dramatically for a few different reasons. Um, First, it was no longer easy to deny that abortions were occurring. In the 1930s, rates of contraceptive and abortion use increased exponentially during the Great Depression. Abortions were still unsafe, as was pregnancy, and entire hospital wards were dedicated to people suffering the complications of illegal abortions. So the idea that abortion is just not something that happens here was no longer possible to maintain. Um, at the same time, prosecutors began to see abortion as more of a problem in the aftermath of World War II at a time when Americans were encouraged to have bigger families as part of the war effort and the rebuilding of the country after the war. Um, being pro-baby and having a big family was seen as a kind of antidote to communism at a time when the Soviet Union had legalized abortion and the Soviet Union's embrace of smaller families and working women was seen as distinctly un-American and un-Christian. And conversely, abortion providers were seen as distinctly un-American and un-Christian as well. It was in this era that abortion providers began deeming abortion, or excuse me, prosecutors began deeming abortion providers racketeers, a term that was often used for organized crime. And on occasion, this was accurate because abortion was illegal. There were organized crime figures in certain instances who were involved in um, access to abortion. But most often, it was a term applied to any abortion provider, um, including grandmothers and other people helping family members have abortions. And as this happened, as more abortion prosecutions began um, occurring, uh, there were also questions about how this was intersecting with the politics of illegitimacy and race. Um, this was an era when uh, people who had children out of wedlock who were white were often sent to maternity homes where they would give birth and have those children adopted by others to conceal that they had had a lapse for what was, a, what was perceived as morality. Um, by contrast, people of color who were having children out of wedlock um, were not uh, seen 
as viewing as lapsing for morality in the same way or were punished in different ways. So this was an era as the 1960s began when states like California began considering proposals to compulsorily sterilize people who had more than one child out of wedlock, overwhelmingly a law that was intending to target welfare recipients who were people of color. And when discussion of out of wedlock pregnancies became a different way of expressing racial animus. Um, all of this was in the background when Finally, I think you began to see reproduction as a constitutional right. Um, this case, Griswold versus Connecticut, began with a mini Comstock law, the, the most egregious of its kind in the era. Connecticut had a ban on married people's use of contraception. This was not a ban on sale or manufacture, it was a ban on use, the only one of its kind. Um, and this at a time after the FDA had approved the birth control pill and millions of Americans had used it. Um, the parties in Griswold had tried to get the Supreme Court to take the case on the constitutionality of this law before and had failed because the court had said no one enforced the law anymore. So Griswold and her colleagues engineered a way to get the law enforced, essentially starting an illegal birth control clinic and all but calling up law enforcement to tell them they were violating the law and then freely volunteering lots of information while being arrested that could be used in subsequent litigation. Uh, the court in Griswold versus Connecticut ultimately did strike down Connecticut's law and did so on the ground that there was a constitutional right to privacy, not spelled out in the text of the document, but a right that was capacious enough to protect married couples' right to use contraception. Uh, at the time Griswold was decided, it was unclear how much this was a decision about marriage, which the court described as an institution older than the Bill of Rights, and to what extent this was a decision about the importance or the privacy one had any time one engaged in sex or contracepted sex in particular. Um, and at the time, because of the ambiguity of Griswold, surprising groups of people supported it. So for example, large percentages of Catholics and even some Catholic activists supported Griswold as a reasonable kind of middle ground decision. But how broad or narrow the right to privacy was would be contested in the years to come. And in advocating for what it might look like beyond that, you also had a very different landscape in terms of whether there would be reproductive rights and what that would look like. In part, that had to do with the rise of a women's liberation movement, as it was called, um, the National Organization for Women, which was one of the largest women's liberation organizations, was founded in a Washington, D.C. hotel room in 1966 and selected Betty Friedan, who's pictured top, uh, one, who was then kind of the closest thing to a feminist celebrity, as its president. Um, Polly Murray, who's pictured at the bottom, a pioneering lawyer and civil rights activist, co-founded the National Organization for Women with Friedan, and within a year of the organization's founding, began to argue that uh, reproductive rights were women's rights and critically constitutional rights. There was a bit of a fight within now about whether to endorse a right to abortion, but after the organization did so, Friedan would often describe abortion, as she put it, as a woman's civil right, and would argue that there could be no full personhood for women until they had the ability to control their reproduction. Um, radical feminist groups, um, often based on college campuses like UC Davis, made even more um, bold feminist arguments for access to both abortion and contraception. Um, and often, particularly when activists of color were involved, framed those as interrelated rather than as discrete rights that could be understood in isolation. It wasn't the women's liberation movement alone that was pushing to change policies on birth control and uh, abortion. There was also at the time what was called the population control movement. The population control movement was incredibly complicated. Some aspects of it uh, had come directly from the eugenics movement, right? So some of the organizations uh, founded as part of the population control movement were founded by eugenicists who recognized that they could no longer openly be eugenicists in the United States after the Second World War when eugenics had kind of become a term of derision, uh, something that was mocked by scientists as racist and out of touch with any kind of evidence or data. Um, Population control, by contrast, argued that it would be good for the nation and for the world if fewer people had children full stop. Um, this argument had a lot of support in a way that eugenics didn't. And so some eugenicists believed that if people had fewer children altogether, the genetic quality of the population would improve. So this would be sort of a backdoor way of achieving eugenic goals. 
But others were attracted to population control movement for different reasons. Um, at the height of the Cold War, many members of Congress believed that in poorer nations, if people had more children, they would be poorer and more desperate and more open to the kind of solicitations of the Soviet Union. Um, on college campuses, population control was often synonymous with an emerging environmentalist movement, right? The idea that more people will consume more resources and lead to more environmental depredations or more climate change. And many feminists on college campus saw population control as a way to talk about rights for women. So you often had a big, diverse, diffuse movement sometimes talking past each other, but agreeing that laws, at least some laws on birth control and abortion had to change. There was a pretty vibrant debate within the black community too. Um, some leaders of the black power movement, like H. Rap Brown, pictured here, um, argued that abortion and birth control both were strategies for what he called black genocide. Um, and there were two flavors of this argument. One provided that abortion and birth control were trying to reduce the size of the black community at a time when the black community needed numbers to fight for civil rights. Uh, another argument provided that people offered in the white world abortion and contraception as solutions to poverty rather than addressing the root causes of poverty itself, like a lack of education or structural racism. Women in the black power and civil rights movement often pushed back against this claim, uh, suggesting that women in the black community needed and wanted access to abortion and contraception, and that abortion and contraception would help people of color achieve equality rather than undermining the struggle of equality and framing the black genocide argument as a sexist one, um, if not a racist one too. So it was at this time by the 1960s that states began considering changing the laws that Horatio Storer had so vigorously promoted in the 19th century. And California was at the epicenter of this effort too. You have Anthony Bylinson pictured at the bottom of the screen here, who was one of the proponents of one of the first major abortion reform bills. Uh, Bylinson and his colleagues often looked to a model developed by the American Law Institute in the late 1950s, which permitted legal abortion under a certain narrow set of circumstances, like sex cases of sexual assault or incest, certain fetal abnormalities, threats to health, and the like. Um, the justification offered that Bylinson and his colleagues argued was that these abortions were happening anyway and that they were unsafe because they were performed unsupervised in back alleys and that it was far better if abortions were going to occur anyway that they occur safely and in therapeutic conditions. Some activists like Pat McGinnis, who's pictured at the top of your screen here, who, another figure in California's abortion reform movement, made avowedly feminist arguments for reform too. Um, but the reform movement uh, gained some steam. Um, interestingly, not just in states like California, but in states across the American South, which were some of the first to consider abortion reform. States like Georgia um, became among the first to adopt this model. And abortion reform prompted the formation of a new anti-abortion movement, very different from the anti-abortion movement of the 19th century. So Horatio Storer's anti-abortion movement had been overwhelmingly Protestant, overwhelmingly elite, overwhelmingly professional-led movement. And the anti-abortion movement of the 1960s um, was overwhelmingly Catholic at its inception, often started directly in Catholic dioceses or by figures in the church. Um, and it made very different arguments. So when states began reforming their abortion laws, anti-abortion figures, for example, would argue that it was unnecessary to legalize abortion because pregnancy was no longer dangerous as a result of the advent of cesarean sections and antibiotics, or that pregnancy in some of the circumstances violence and pointed to, like sexual assault, was all but impossible. And unsurprisingly, these arguments were, were not successful. People were getting pregnant in these scenarios. And so instead, people in the anti-abortion movement began to argue that liberal abortion laws were quite simply unconstitutional because the word person in the Constitution, in particular the Equal Protection Clause and Due Process Clause, applied from the moment an egg was fertilized. And that liberal abortion laws then violated the rights to equal protection and due process under the law of these fetal persons, an argument that we've seen play out recently um, in court decisions in Alabama and elsewhere. So the anti-abortion movement initially was fighting for the status quo, right? Fighting for criminal laws that had been on the books um, since the 19th century, uh, including laws like New Hampshire's where there was no life exception, which the anti-abortion movement fought to maintain in the face of an effort to include a new life exception. 
It was against this backdrop that the Supreme Court ultimately agreed to hear Roe v. Wade, a backdrop of extreme state-by-state -state conflict, conflict that was unfolding in terms of ballot initiatives, state legislative struggles, and litigation launched by both opponents and proponents of legal abortion, which had led to sort of a stalemate. Neither side had a particularly keen edge. Um, there were back and forth moments, one of the most pronounced being in New York State, which became the first state to repeal all of its, well, actually second after Hawaii to repeal all of its criminal abortion restrictions before viability. But it was at this point that at the time, the Democratic Party, which in New York was the more anti-abortion party, had a majority that voted to reinstate abortion restrictions in the state and had that vetoed by a Republican governor, Nelson Rockefeller. So the partisan politics of abortion were very different, but what was similar was that there had already been a profound conflict that had emerged that reached beyond the contours just of abortion. Uh, Roe, of course, involved a woman named Norma McCorvey, pictured here, who had already had several children she had given up for adoption, and when she was pregnant on a third occasion, decided that she wanted to terminate that pregnancy. She consulted an attorney with whom she had worked on her past adoptions, who directed her to two lawyers, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, who had been looking to tee up a challenge to Texas's abortion law, which, like most at the time, criminalized abortion unless a patient's life was at risk. Um, McCorvey, of course, wanted to have an abortion, not become the plaintiff in a test case, but that is ultimately what happened and what her lawyer's interest was in seeing happen. The court in Roe uh, ultimately held that the right to privacy recognized in Griswold and so expanded in significant decisions was broad enough to encompass a patient's decision to terminate her pregnancy. Um, the court suggested that the decision to have an abortion was salient in similar ways to decisions to get married, to have a child, to use contraception, that these key life decisions about family and intimacy were protected from significant state interference. At some points, Justice Harry Blackmun, the author of the opinion, a Nixon nominee and himself a Republican, pointed to what he saw as the consequences for an unwanted, of an unwanted pregnancy for a pregnant person themselves, such as the health risks of pregnancy or the stigma of unwed parenthood. But often Roe focused on the rights of physicians, suggesting that the abortion decision belonged jointly to the patient and the physician. At various points after Roe, people in fact thought that it was a right for a physician to choose abortion, not for a right for women. Um, the court explicitly rejected the claim of fetal personhood, suggesting that the word person in the relevant parts of the Constitution applied only postnatally. Um, and initially, Roe was less of a big deal than you would have expected. It was not the top story in the New York Times that day, although to be fair, um, there had just been, Lyndon Johnson had just died, so it wasn't that, it wasn't that weird. But um, I don't think people understood it, that it was going to be as big of a deal as it was, because as Blackman himself said at the time in his papers, he was simply doing what he thought the Constitution required, but also what the polls said, right? The polls said most people think abortion is a decision between a woman and her doctor. Um, recognizing a right to abortion didn't mean abortion was accessible. So there, had, there were birth control clinics all across the United States. There was nothing comparable when it claimed to abortions. Um, the overwhelming majority of abortions in the United States in the 1970s were performed in hospitals, and somewhere between 15 and 24% of all hospitals offered abortions, which meant that the vast majority of Americans who needed access or wanted access to abortions lived nowhere near a hospital. So this was the birth of the abortion clinic. Organizations like Planned Parenthood, and the National Abortion Rights Action League raised money to create clinics, which would be consequential both in terms of radically expanding access to abortion and also laying the groundwork for the idea that abortion was quintessentially different from birth control, quintessentially different from healthcare, and physically isolated from either one, right? So this was the beginning of what would become massive anti-abortion protests outside of clinics, which were not viewed in the same light as hospitals. It was in this era, too, that anti-abortion groups did not at all back away from the idea of fetal personhood. The overwhelming focus of the anti-abortion movement in the years after Roe was what they called the Human Life Amendment, a constitutional amendment that would change the meaning of the word person in the 14th Amendment to apply to a fertilized egg um, or any other, an embryo or a fetus. 
Um, the Human Life Amendment was so important to the anti-abortion movement that when members of Congress suggested it would be easier to get an amendment through that said states had the right to do whatever they wanted about abortion, anti-abortion activists overwhelmingly rejected the idea, saying it would essentially reaffirm Roe, which in their view stood not for the proposition that there was a right to abortion particularly, but that there was no right to life for a fetus. Um, this struggle for the Human Life Amendment brought the anti-abortion movement into electoral politics as the movement desperately strived to find allies in Congress and in state legislatures who would support a Human Life Amendment. And it ultimately brought the anti-abortion movement into an alliance with the Republican Party, which in the era of Ronald Reagan came to embrace the movement and the Human Life Amendment as a potential path to power, a way to peel off conservative, Catholic, and evangelical Protestants who had voted Democratic often for reasons of economics, um, but who could be convinced to change to the Republican Party as a result of the abortion issue. Um, it was in this era, too, that the anti-abortion movement stumbled upon a more ultimately convinced, excuse me, consequential strategy, um, the, uh, what we would think of as kind of incrementalism or a death of a thousand cuts. And this began with the Hyde Amendment. Uh, the Hyde Amendment was the brainchild of Henry Hyde, a long-term legislator from Illinois, who proposed that Medicaid patients should be unable to get reimbursed for uh, most or all abortions. And at the time, the Hyde Amendment, which is part of an appropriations bill, passed with the votes of both Democrats and Republicans. Um, at a time when abortion rights was already becoming a democratic cause. Why that was in part was because people in the Democratic Party believed the Supreme Court would take care of it and strike down the Hyde Amendment. Um, and it was in part because there was already less emphasis put on access for low income people than would be or really ought to be the case. Um, the Hyde Amendment passed in 1976 and it had immediately significant impacts. Um, a large percentage of people pursuing abortion in the 1970s in the United States were Medicaid recipients. And by most estimates, uh, upwards of 200 or 250,000 patients each year who otherwise would have had abortions uh, were prevented from doing so as a result of the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment also ensured that people who were low income would have to rely on an intricate network of abortion funds and private charities for money to seek out abortion. And that, in some ways, is what became of the grassroots of the reproductive rights movement in the immediate aftermath of Roe. They all went into service and access work, um, which is part of what I think explains the lack of somewhat of a visible grassroots in the post-Roe era. There was, of course, an early reproductive justice movement, too, that argued that what had become the so-called pro-choice movement, which sought to protect the right recognized in Roe, was not enough. Um, and this movement, in part, took its inspiration from an epidemic of sterilization abuse. Um, women of color in this era and other people of color were being involuntarily sterilized, sometimes under existing eugenic sterilization laws, sometimes under no legal authority at all. Physicians were notorious in cross parts of the South for offering what they called Mississippi appendectomies, in which patients who went in for childbirth or other services were involuntarily sterilized without their knowledge or consent, um, again, in, particularly in states like Mississippi. The problem was particularly acute in Puerto Rico, where large percentages of women at some point in their reproductive lives um, were sterilized, uh, often with questionable or no consent. And so activists like Helen Rodriguez Trias, who's pictured here, argued that any movement for reproductive rights had to be not just a movement um, for freedom from the government, but a, right, a movement uh, that sought to protect people using the power of the government, right? A movement that would say the government should guarantee informed consent, the government should guarantee the means for people who want to have children to have them. Um, and Rodriguez Trias and her colleagues founded organizations like the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse in 1974 and broader multi-issue groups like uh, a group called CARASA or R2N2, both of which were reproductive justice groups founded in the late 1970s. Um, but uh, none of these groups succeeded in slowing down the attack on abortion rights and other forms of reproductive health care. Um, where that attack turned ironically involved two improbable things, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor and Akron, Ohio, which don't usually go together. Um, so Akron, Ohio was the site of an ordinance uh, 
that had been marketed as the anti by the anti-abortion movement as a model for the rest of the country. And its constitutionality ultimately came before the Supreme Court in 1980 um, after O'Connor had become Ronald Reagan's first Supreme Court nominee. Um, the anti-abortion movement hated Sandra Day O'Connor. They thought she was a supporter of abortion rights and a feminist and generally just gross. And uh, she, um, to their surprise, dissented from an opinion by the court striking down this Akron ordinance, not only to say the ordinance was constitutional, but to say that Roe itself was fatally flawed. And that if Roe itself was fatally flawed, it was at least w deserving of some reconsideration. So the anti-abortion movement, which had been utterly unable to get a constitutional amendment off the ground, needed a plan B. It was unable to get that constitutional amendment un off the ground when Ronald Reagan was in power, when Republicans controlled both houses of Congress, and when it seemed as if Republicans had fared better than usual in state legislative elections. There was still no prospect of a personhood amendment and no prospect even of agreement on a second best solution for the anti-abortion movement. So if there was going to be no personhood amendment, what could there be? Well, there could be control of the Supreme Court. And with control of the Supreme Court, there could be the upholding of more laws like the Hyde Amendment, which would mean less access to abortion and a right to abortion that would mean very little or less and less in practice, a right that people would feel less compelled or energized to defend. And with that, ultimately, too, in the long term, could be a Supreme Court that would recognize a fetus as a person in a way that an American public that seemed to reject the principle never might. And so with this, the anti-abortion movement proceeded uh, to uh, focus on incrementalism, looking for laws that could be argued to be consistent with Roe and then defending them before the courts. And the movement too began to look for arguments that would cement its relationship with an emerging conservative legal movement. Um, it's hard to uh, imagine as a non-historian how liberal the legal orthodoxy prior to the 1980s was. Um, overwhelmingly, the justices that someone like Richard Nixon selected were themselves not very conservative because the legal academy, the bench, and the bar were all fairly um, on the same page in terms of conventional legal principles. This was to change after the founding of the Federalist Society um, by three law students uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, the Federalist Society's founders believed that this liberal, or liberal orthodoxy stifled debate on law school campuses. And very quickly, the Federalist Society became a center of power. Uh, Ronald Reagan overwhelmingly, even in the early years of the group, looked to Federalist Society advisors and speakers to staff his administration and nominate judges. But for the anti-abortion movement, this was not an unqualified good development. Uh, to begin with, not everyone in the Federalist Society liked the anti-abortion movement or agreed that abortion should be criminal. And other members of the Federalist Society just thought that the anti-abortion movement was too extreme, too affiliated with law-breaking, too affiliated with Christianity to be worthy of partnering with uh, for a group that wanted to create a conservative legal elite. This convinced anti-abortion groups that they needed to find common ground. And so they began, for example, to look for strategies that would rely more on the role of history or even original intent. And this changed arguments against abortion in ways that are still consequential today. It also led anti-abortion groups to argue that pregnancy should be a crime, um, more so than it already had been, that pregnant drug users could be charged with child abuse, that people who killed pregnant people should be charged with homicide. Um, rather than viewing the personhood of the fetus as something that would require more support for pregnant people, um, instead the argument was that the fetus was a victim of crime, just as were others in Ronald Reagan's war on crime, and that the way to protect the rights of a fetal person was to exact retribution against those who wronged the fetal person. It was against this backdrop that the Supreme Court decided another case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. At this time, everyone expected the Supreme Court to overrule Roe, but the court in Casey defied expectations and preserved what it called the essential holding of Roe, that there was a right to choose abortion before viability or the point at which survival outside of the womb was possible. Uh, Casey also held that laws were permissible, though, if they didn't unduly, abortion, unduly burden access to abortion. And this seemed to be a pretty forgiving standard. And indeed, the court in Casey upheld every abortion restriction before it but one. Uh, 
Casey also focused the anti-abortion movement in a new direction on the argument that if women and other pregnant people were abortion's second victims because abortion opponents believed that if the Supreme Court no longer concluded that there was a tension between the rights of the fetus and the rights of pregnant people, they would no longer justify abortion rights. So anti-abortion groups set out to create their own research institutes and journals to publish claims that abortion increased the risk of things like post-traumatic stress disorder um, and breast cancer. It was in this era, too, that a re more vigorous and long-lasting reproductive justice movement formed, led by groups like Sister Song, members of which are pictured here. Uh, the reproductive justice movement pushed back against this idea that women needed to be protected from abortion, particularly by saying, one, this was an argument that presupposed that people of color were being easily led by a primarily white group of physicians, and two, by saying that this argument didn't make sense because it presupposed that people were having healthy pregnancies and safe experiences raising families, but for the experience of abortion, when if anything, the opposite was true. When there were problems of maternal mortality and morbidity, lack of access to contraception and sex education and healthcare writ large in communities of color that had to be addressing too, while contending that it was not enough to simply pursue abortion rights, that a more capacious right or agenda for reproductive justice had to be considered. The anti-abortion movement had new allies in this period too, particularly those that considered themselves openly Christian and argued that the founding of the United States had been a Christian event with a Christian constitution that should be interpreted in line with Christian principles. Groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, founded in 1993, became behemoths with massive budgets and reach that began to reshape how the fight against abortion proceeded, um, moving it away from a single issue struggle about one thing, abortion, and toward a broader kind of agenda that presented abortion as connected to religious liberty, the separation of church and state, LGBTQ rights, and more. The Supreme Court intervened another time before Dobbs, upholding a ban on so-called partial birth abortion in 2007. Um, and the anti-abortion movement involved itself heavily in cases not related to abortion, including issues like campaign finance, believing that if more money flowed into American politics, more Republicans would be elected and the anti-abortion movement would gain more influence over the Republican Party, making it easier to get the right kind of judges nominated and ensure that Roe would be overturned. And in fact, that's what happened in Dobbs in 2022. When the court, uh, faced with a 15-week abortion ban and no dispute in the lower courts about the constitutionality of such a law, nevertheless decided to take the case, overturn Roe v. Wade, and declare that a right to abortion was never, was not and never had been rooted in the nation's history and tradition. Um, Dobbs, of course, has received lots of attention from historians for lots of reasons, one of which is it's ignoring a consensus of, among historians about what history and tradition actually say. Um, but of course, Dobbs also opened the, win the door to other potential challenges to reproductive rights down the road, some of which we can talk about. Um, since Dobbs, we've seen lots of different kinds of litigation that point to where some of this history be, may be going. Um, there's what I think is an, an emergent campaign to reverse Dobbs centered on abortion exceptions. Uh, women like Kate Cox, pictured at the bottom, um, and Amanda Zorowski, pictured here, are arguing that the state abortion bans, with narrow exceptions, either have to be interpreted more broadly or that those exceptions, in fact, violate state constitutions. So this litigation is continuing in states like Texas, Kentucky, Tennessee, and elsewhere. Um, again, this is state constitutional litigation. It's not a direct challenge to Dobbs, but it's designed to deal Dobbs a death of a thousand cuts, right? To say that if this is the world Dobbs has ushered in, it's unworkable. We've seen two, count them, two U.S. Supreme Court cases on abortion in one term after Dobbs told us that the federal courts were out of this game. Uh, one of which um, involves the FDA's authority to approve mifepristone, a drug used in more than half of U.S. abortions. The case also involves a claim that the FDA never had the authority to make abortion pills available via telehealth because Anthony Comstock's law was never repealed and is argued to make it a federal crime to mail abortion-related items today. There's another case involving the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which uh, the Biden administration has argued requires access for abortion to patients in certain medical emergencies. Uh, this, claim, this case also involves the claim by states like Texas and Idaho that federal law actually treats an unborn child as a patient and that some states like California may be prohibited from providing access to emergency abortions because of the federal law rather than required to do so. 
And finally, of course, as we saw just in the past few weeks, there's the ongoing struggle for fetal personhood. Um, if you were wondering, like, what is the next Roe v. Wade for the anti-abortion movement, it, it was and always has been fetal personhood. But now that Roe is out of the way, the campaign for fetal personhood has intensified considerably. Um, it's reflected in state laws recognizing the personhood of fetuses for person purposes like tax deductions, um, and child support laws, and recently in a decision of the Alabama Supreme Court, um, holding that for the purposes of the state's wrongful death of a minor law, uh, a frozen embryo is a child or person, and that therefore suits for the destruction of embryos can be brought um, as wrongful death suits. Uh, these claims are all designed eventually to return, ironically, not to Congress, not to state legislators, not to voters, but to the US Supreme Court. Because we've seen um, after Roe's demise, ironically, that when voters are faced with questions involving reproductive rights and justice, they tend overwhelmingly to support reproductive rights and justice. And so instead, uh, groups that have long complained about anti-democratic courts interjecting themselves into questions of reproduction are instead seeking out courts um, and arguing that as a matter of the Constitution's original public meaning, um, access to abortion, potentially access to IVF, potentially access to contraception is itself unconstitutional. Um, so when people ask me sort of, <laughs> my favorite question is people, usually not from the United States, ask me, when is this going to be over? And the answer is probably <laughs> never, right? Um, but I think one of the other things that's clear in the history of reproductive rights and justice is that it's always very much been a story about uh, the health of democracy, right? Who gets to vote? whether you get to vote at all, how money is influencing how you vote. And so I think in terms of how this turns out, a good barometer will be how healthy is the democracy in the first place. So I'll stop there. So I think now people are supposed to ask questions and then C-SPAN is going to follow you covertly with a mic. So if people have questions, just raise your hand. <laughs> or not? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just a sec, over here. So. So um, just by way of transparency, Mary Krogan, provost and executive vice chancellor here at UC Davis and a reproductive perinatal epidemiologist who was thrilled, thank you, <laughs> to have you recruited to UC Davis. So one, uh, as thoroughly comprehensive as this was, and it's an uh, amazing talk and delivered exceptionally well, the, the one thing I um, didn't hear was one person who I've worked with in this field is Dolores Huerta, mm -hmm. who worked very hard against forced sterilization mm -hmm. of Latinas, particularly in relationship to the farm workers' rights movement. And I wondered if you had anything to say on that, because those was another one of these intersections of time in the 1960s and 70s that was pretty dramatic, and again, particularly in California. Yeah, I mean, California was, was the site of a lot of forced sterilizations at a lot of points in time. Um, and in the 60s and 70s, in California, just as was happening in other states, overwhelmingly forcible sterilizations moved from being a problem primarily for low-income white people who had been more exposed to the state to being a problem overwhelmingly affecting people of color, particularly Latino women in the United States, um, and in California in particular. Um, and so this was part of, I think, the, the move toward a reproductive justice movement really across the country because in New York it was people who were Puerto Rican, in Mississippi it was people who were black, in California it was people who were Latina. And so um, it wasn't just people of color who were leading a reproductive justice movement, but they were often the ones saying a reproductive right doesn't mean anything if it presupposes that you don't ever need the protection of the government. Um, sometimes you may need the government to support you, not just to leave you alone. And that was because people like those in California were experiencing that firsthand, right? They weren't, they didn't have the privilege of just saying, okay, the government has gone away, now I'm all set. That wasn't their experience. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Oh, time's up. Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> thanks, so no.
Thanks for listening to this week's Lectures in History podcast. To find even more history content, visit c-span.org slash ahtv.